All right, are we getting started? Are we ready? I'm just gonna say yes. Hey everyone, if we can have um, the cast and the creative come on screen of all the Meza shows so we can applaud you. Woo! Thanks for joining us. Um, if you can just, when you come on, um, if you can just say your name and the show you were a part of, um, if you were obviously part of more than one this season as well. Let's start with you, Tavia. <laughs> Uh, my name is Tavia Hunt, and I was a part of Blessings, and I read stage directions for Daughters of the Confederacy. Amazing. I'm Maul. I was um, a part of Blessings, as you saw. My name is Tyler Cruz. I was I read stage directions for um, Blessings, and I played Alexandra in Daughters of the Confederacy. Hi, my name is Nome. I um, was Baraka in Blessings. Yes. Alexandra. Oh, hi. I'm Alexandra and I was a part of Blessings. Tyler. I went. Oh, it's okay. Johnny. Uh, hi, I'm Johnny. I was a part of Daughters of the Confederacy. I played William Warpole Merriweather. Hi, all. Um, I'm on the love. Uh, I read for Private Bets in Where Pathways Meet by A.K. Payne. So good to be here. Hey, hi, I'm Shayum. Uh, I play Dwight in Where the Pathways Meet by A.K. Payne. And then let's hear from our directors and our tech team. Edmund, are you here? We want to say thank you too if you're here. Yay. Hi, so I'm Edmund uh, and I stage managed all three of the readings for Summer Camp. Ooh. Hi, I'm Alex. I directed Blessings and I'm one of the core artistic directors of the Summer Camp Ray. Hi, I'm Christopher Betts. I'm one of the core artistic directors of the Summer Cabaret. I directed Daughters of the Confederacy and Where Pathways Meet. Uh, and I'm Liam and I design sound for the season. And Abigail, I think you're Yes, uh, hi, I'm Ab, sorry. I'm Abigail, I am the uh, one of the actors for AK Payne's play, uh, Where Pathways Meet, as well as um, Angie Bridget Jones, uh, The Daughters of the Confederacy. Great. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Congratulations on an amazing Meza summer season. You all work so hard. Oh, we have a guest. Hey, Kay. You just want to introduce yourself and your name and the play. Hi. Yeah, I'm AK Payne. Uh, I wrote Where Pathways Meet. Amazing. Um, I was just saying thank you, everyone, and congratulations to the cast. And thank you to the audience for sticking with us. We really appreciate it. I'm Ashley Thomas. I'm the co-moderator along with our lovely, she's to the side of me, but. 
<laughs> Faith Zomble, our other wonderful co-moderator. So the way this is going to work is we're going to ask some questions. We're going to talk to the cast and the creative, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. So you'll have a chance to also ask everyone questions as well. Um, and we just want to have a good time and celebrate this evening. So we're going to kick it off. Um, We'd like to thank one of our sponsors, the Yale Center for Race, Indigeneity, and Transnational Migration. They sent in some questions, which is really exciting. And um, we'll kick it off with them. Thanks so much, Ashley, for that introduction. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for coming again. Um, and thank you all who are on this panel. I'm really excited to talk to you. Um, so the first question is, pretty broad, so you can answer it however you want. Um, but it felt important to acknowledge the material conditions, like the fact that we're in a pandemic and the fight for Black lives is continuing in the streets right now. Um, and so one of the things that I wanted to ask is, how did the creation of this work shift um, because of those external conditions? Um, do you feel like you, were freer to explore questions of race and identity or more limited? Um, this is a super general question to get started, but I guess I'm, what I'm really asking is, how did these events shape your process as you were making this work? That's a tricky one to answer. Um, uh, but I think for me, especially working on this one, which was clearly in response to like a very specific um, event, but also many events uh, that are similar, I think coming into it, it felt like, in my experience, it felt like myself along with the other actors and like all the creative team we were like speaking the same language and like i felt like it actually was like very aligning and like very unifying especially being in a cast that was like made up of entirely like black women pr pretty much and like i think so yeah in my experience i i found it like very like grounding um and yeah it felt like we were sort of all on the same page in terms of like, not in terms of like our healing and like our activism or even really like our understanding or like processing of what is going on, but certainly like in um, holding space for one another and like in allowing for whatever needed to come up. And that felt um, very new and like unique to my creative process at least. I don't know if that answers the question. Um, yeah, something that was incredibly resonant for me was um, there's specific lines uh, and text in, in AK's play that uh, metaphorically refer to things that happen um, in our history. I think um, Minnie has a line and, and um, Abigail, if you could uh, correct me where they say, where she says, um, uh, she lists names of people that have been um, killed and lost their lives, you know, um, at the hands of police brutality or, or, or whoever. Um, but I, you know, that was incredibly resonant for me because I think that, you know, that was something that was very race specific and um, depend, it didn't matter what time we were talking about it. Um, you know, it was something that was very real for us um, on the moon in uh, where the pathways meet and you know, there are other references too that um, AK has um, that refer to things that happen on planet Earth. Um, but there are, there are small metaphorical things in the play that, um, you know, really resonated with me um, and gave me just a, a great point of connection.
Let's hear from maybe one more before we move on. Um, I think in a lot of ways, uh, I've been thinking a lot about like how this particular moment shapes like the work that a lot of black writers are doing um, and how um, like the struggle has always continued and the way in which like black life has been a target for so much violence is like not a new thing. Um, but I think that in this time, I'm really grateful for the sort of space to talk about it in a global like broader sense um, and the way in which like there seems to be a collective movement to like fight and hear black voices um, in a way that like feels different than than past times, at least to me. And I think for me, that gave me space as I was revising where pathways meet for this um, to revise in a way that was reflective of that space, um, if that makes sense, and 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 with more grace because of that space. Uh, but yeah, I, I do think that there's something about like a continuous struggle uh, that like is important to acknowledge that like the work is is ongoing and not new. Thank you for that. Um, so just a reminder, we're going to ask questions and then we'll open it up for questions from the audience through the Q&A function. So thank you so much for everyone for being with us. Um, the next question that came from the Yale Center for Race, Indigeneity, and Transnational Migration is, um, what do you imagine the afterlives of these works? I, I know this isn't traditional theater. This is Zoom theater. I joke and say now we go to Zoom University. But how do you all imagine, in, imagine these works existing? And how do you imagine yourself participating in theater works that exist in this digital uh, space that we're in right now? Um, I think that for me, I loved all three plays uh, so deeply that working on them through Zoom, it was so funny because I, I, I know when I was directing, I kept pushing them to the limit of what Zoom can be and trying to embrace um, what Zoom can be. Um, and it really, really made me hanker for to like put the shows up on their feet. I think especially um, in Angie's play, it, there's so much physical comedy in that, in that play. And I think that a lot of humor was able to be found because we could not be physical and we had to do things through a camera and like sort of leaning into that medium really worked for that play. But there was still a hunger. I still have a hunger to see all three of these plays up on their feet and to work on these plays up on their feet because um, I think that they're all incredibly theatrical and they demand to be theatricalized. And you know, that is that is not what Zoom is. So when I have work that when I come across work that demands to be theatricalized, that makes me want to put it on a stage. So while I feel like uh, we reached what we could through this medium, given this medium and given the current state of our world, it, it made me very hungry to see these productions have a full, these uh, plays have a full life with full production in tech and costumes. I also just like all of that stuff. I like, give me the, give me the set, give me the budget, give me all that. So of course I want to see it like that. But I think that these three plays in general demand that. Um, so if no one else has anything that they want to add, although you could feel free to stop me if you do, um, I'm going to move us to the next question, um, which sort of relates to the one that came before, um, which is what has the experience of working on Zoom, working in these interesting times taught you about theater making that perhaps you would want to take with you going forward? Um, and how do you think it will affect the way that you approach work in the future? And maybe there's nothing. And what you've learned is that you hate Zoom, which is also an acceptable answer. I think that Zoom really helped push my imagination. Um, you know, creating the world of the play in, you know, your tight space and imagining that you're talking to this person that's you know, supposed to be right in front of you, even though, even though you're looking at the green dot. Like, for me, I really had to set the space um, and also 
kind of, you know, take time to just know where I am in the world of the play and really, really focus on what is happening outside of this small box that is affecting me. Um, at first, it was very hard. Like, it, it was difficult. I did not like it at all. But, you know, I, over time, I started to kind of like, um, you know, for lack of a better word, experiment, you know, with what I could create around me and how those things could affect me. Um, you know, especially in, in AK's play where there's so many things that happen in front of us, like the magic and, you know, the, the hammer being created and the rocks, the stones turning into um, whatever they were turning into and the rain, it, it just forced me to really use my imagination um, in ways that I, I don't think I've ever done before on stage because it, it, it usually happens right there in front of you, whether it's with lights or sound or, or anything like that. Yeah, and to add on to what um, Sharon said was, is that um, I think an interesting thing about um, um, Zoom is that there's no excuses. Like you, there's no budget, there's no nothing. <laughs> you, you just have an opportunity to be able to be like, if I want to put up a black clay and I want to make it as black as I want, <laughs> you know, um, this medium is a perfect medium for you to do it. Um, it it's uh, definitely made it a lot easier for me as um, a performer and as a writer to kind of be like, I just want to put something up and I could just call up some of my friends and be like, hey, can you read this? And can we just do like a little Zoom production real quick? And there we go, we have a play in a matter of seconds. Um, and so I think that this medium really does open doors for, if, you're, if you decide tomorrow that you want to start writing, your heart out and that you want to put up some stuff you can have your mom be an actor and it'll it'll work it'll work so um i i think that that it is it's exhausting zoom fatigue is a thing it's very exhausting but i think it's worth it in the long run i also think that zoom is interesting because you obviously don't have one of the elements that's uh, pretty critical to live theater, which is like an audience, but I like an audience that like you are breathing the same air and within the same space. Um, but I think in my like limited experience with Zoom theater, it's like really made me like reaffirm and like reconnect with like my personal like process and like preparation and also like my engagement with my scene partner so that I'm not like relying on like validation that I might receive from like people laughing or like or what whatever it is and like obviously that's great and like I said something funny but like I think like I don't know there's something really like wonderful and I think also to like uh, Abigail's point something that's really freeing about just like being in this space where there isn't either the validation or like if you perceive it as judgment or like, or whatever it is. And so it feels like a little bit, like you can like cut it up more and like, that's really strange. And, and I think it's also sort of made me think a lot about like how I want to engage in my work. Like once I'm back in a studio and like back with my peers and like back in an audience and like, what can I, what from that release and like that freedom can I hang on to? Um, so that I'm no longer feeling like I'm having to um, like rely on sort of, for me, sometimes it is like that like validation or that, yeah, that like energy from an audience. And I'll say too, uh, honestly, Zoom acting is really hard. I think it's completely different than what we're, trained to do like we kind of have to go against everything that we're taught as actors but the thing that i actually do appreciate about zoom is like it kind of goes back to the basics of for me i realize it's like an incredible um act of like faith and trust because all we really have are the playwright's words so for me like going through this process i was like okay if i just trust the playwright's words and because I don't have the stimulation that I would have in a live theater space, like trusting the words that I have in front of me, trusting my own imagination, trusting my company, even though we're not connected in the same ways that we would be 
in a live setting, I feel like there is something about Zoom acting that does bring it back to the basics of relying on the language, relying on the text to give me everything that I need and kind of simplifying, which I actually do appreciate. Um, just to say something about what Alex just said, uh, that's what I'm really excited to explore in the future is because when you're on here, you have to find a different way to uh, connect. And what you just said about the language is like how you say something is your only form of connecting to you as the only way they're gonna receive anything from you. You know what I mean? Because when you're doing a Zoom play, a lot of the times you have to go back and forth between a script. So it, it, how many times do you actually have the opportunity to look at the person? That usually comes a bit after. There's a, a lot of technicality that comes to doing stuff on here. And so I think uh, bringing it back down to language and then once all of this is over, having to come back in person with somebody, you literally had to expand your notion of connection. You don't have body, you don't have these other things. So I think it'll, I think it'll work for a lot of us when we get back in person with people, because now we can't just, um, you know, punk out and rely on five other things. You know, we've been through that storm already. We can do something else now, so. Thank you so much, Sierra. I think that's a perfect place to wrap up this question. And um, I just want to welcome you to the call. Would you mind um, introducing yourself? We have Angie Jones on the call, and I think we have Anthony Brown who also logged in. So if you want not mind just waving, saying your name, um, the play you were associated with, and we'll move on to the next question. Ooh, okay, I can go. Hello. Hi, excuse my uh, tardiness, uh, my CPT. My name is Angie Bridget Jones. I am the playwright of Daughters of the Confederacy. I am also a Capricorn and um, House Ravenclaw. So I hope that helps. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Anthony. I play Jackson Where Pathways Meet uh, by AK, directed by Christopher. Yeah, glad to be here. Sorry I'm late. Sorry I'm late. Wi-Fi issues. And then Sierra, I'm not sure what character you played, Oh, Sorry. Oh, sorry. All right. So I'm Sierra, um, in Daughters of the Confederacy, and I play Meriwether. <laughs> Thank you all so much. So Alexandra, your point about not being connected with people leads me to my next question. Um, uh, dealing with connectedness, being so tuned in all the time, you're tuned in to Zoom rehearsal day in, day out, you're looking at your computer for the script, and that inadvertently may lead you to looking at the news and then checking social media. So how did you all protect yourselves, your physical and mental health, during these pandemics, uh, you know, as in all mediums. And I say we're living in three plant pandemics if you're a black woman, you know? So how did you really protect yourself during these um, stressful times? Wait, the question was, how did we protect ourselves during? Mm -hmm. During the rehearsal period, how did you just protect your physical and mental health? I, I would like to say laughing for myself, um, because if I don't laugh at something, why am I here? You know, I, I, just laughing and trying to find a little bit of joy and poking fun at this thing through the computer like there was this one really fun moment where um abigail has to pop back on screen with something in her hand and that was just uh the highlight of my week because we all started popping back on screen during rehearsal with like hot sauce a freaking uh roller rack just stupid just something god give me something so laughter yeah <laughs> Well, um, I've been taking use of uh, Yale Health's uh, 
counseling and therapy. So that's what I've been doing uh, once a week to just protect myself, um, getting it all out once a week and trying to, you know, apply it to my life, you know, apply it to the craft and just um, move through this transitional period with ease. So that's what's been helping me lately. I don't know if my um, answer will, I don't know if it answers you directly, but uh, I feel like I haven't been protected in a sense of like, what am I doing to take care of myself? And it's felt more of, um, it just feels like an ongoing continuous period of growth and change and confronting a lot about myself and where I'm at in life. and. You know, it's, it's, so it kind of feels like just standing, um, I don't know, in front of like a massive wave that feels like what 2020 is right now. Um, but kind of connecting that to Zoom, uh, when it had started, kind of like what Shane mentioned, it was really hard, but a um, couple of months in, I'm, I'm beginning to accept uh, I don't know, this big advantage of it, which uh, is, uh, sorry, um, the reality of things is uh, if, you know, I need to leave the country soon, but I can still continue working with people that I know, people that I've trained with. Um, and that's a nice reminder. And it's also a reminder of responsibility that you aren't disconnected at any given point from your community, from people that you can take support, comfort from, as hard as it may be to reach out for that. Um, so yeah, so Zoom is kind of like a double-edged sword, like you can't get away from it, but also there's so much that you can do with it at any given point. Um, I don't know how that relates to protecting oneself. I think I'm still figuring that one out. Something that's also been, you know, I mean, the pandemic has been horrible. Um, Y'all better be wearing your masks. But it's, it's been good for me in the sense that, like, I can't work towards ambition anymore. Um, and I can only work towards, like, personal, internal growth. And because, I mean things are shut down right now. Like I can't be ambitious and say, oh, I'm gonna go make these connections and you know, go out there and audition for this thing. In a way it's still happening, but it's given me a lot of time to just like reflect and think about you know, the type of people, the type of person I am, the people I wanna surround myself with. Um, and that in a, in a way has given me room to actually just like grow. Um, sans the, the acting ambition part of it um and i think that's been really helpful for me i've i can honestly say that like this summer has has changed me a lot um only because of the fact that i've given myself that time to actually reflect and and find that personal growth um it's been healing I'll say for me, um, y'all, it's hard. It's so hard. But something recently that has been really life changing in a way um, is me connecting to this idea of like self compassion and um, honoring however I feel unapologetically and also honoring and expressing what it is that I need not only for myself, but from other people. So if that means there's a moment where I need to pr prioritize black joy, if I need to um, have a moment of stillness or silence, if I need to like dance or, you know, having things around me um, that support whatever I'm feeling and, and to honor it first and foremost, without apology, without guilt or shame. And then also like this, Having a sense of community, because I think that's been one of the hardest parts is 
all of the ways I think I'm used to coping with certain things have to do with relating to other people. And now that that's kind of been removed, how do I, how do I replace that feeling of community, which is so important to me through like other mediums. So, you know, like doing free yoga classes or therapy and, and checking in with people that I love and, you know, whatever I could possibly do, just honoring however I feel and what I need in that moment and then going from there. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, this question is going to be the last one before we open up to the Q and A. Um, I'm going to switch tasks a little bit, um, and I wanted to ask you all um, because so many of these plays deal with freedom and what it means to live a good life or a happy life, um, and all of the things that sometimes stand in the way of Black people being able to access those um, ways of being in the world. I wanted to ask you all, what does freedom look like for you as performers, as directors, writers, creatives, um, stage managers? Uh, what does, which could mean, what does freedom look like in your industry specifically, or what freedom looks like for you personally? Um, but yeah, I would just love to, to hear from you all, like, what is the world that you are imagining? Freedom look like, looks like um, visually, I see more Viola Davises on stage. I see more, um, I see more people with different accents, different languages, uh, different skin tone, different body types. Um, that is not the stereotypical Hollywood look on stage, on film. Um, I see uh, uh, black playwrights on a daily um, bringing stuff up. I see black directors. I see uh, people of color everywhere. <laughs> like my mind, it's like the, that, that kind of freedom to know that like I can be the actor that goes out into the world and knows that somebody is going to want my body um, as a performer, period, is what I see as like a free liberating actor's life, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I think, oh. Oh, everybody was ready to answer that one. Go ahead, Tavia. Oh, uh, it's short. I think um, for me, something that I found really freeing about this play that I just worked on and something that I would love to see expressed more fully is just like putting a name to a thing. Like I feel like just like, I don't know, like with all of these plays, like we're, we're like naming these things that are often so like hidden or like coveted or they're like really softened or they're uh, they're shared like hyperbolically or it's like things that we are like as black people and especially as black women are meant to express or are socialized to express um you know shame about and like i find it like so freeing to just be able to like put a name to the thing and to say like this is what's happening and like that's incredibly like affirming and like liberating and like exciting and so yeah just to be able to like boldly stand in like our truths as black americans and definitely as black women um that that's what comes to mind for me um i think being able to survive and create art like on our own terms when i say our i mean like all the different ways the black diaspora exists and shows up um, without necessarily being limited uh, based on capitalism and based on the way that capitalism like manipulates our stories um, and like makes us have to perform for white gaze and spectatorship. Um, so yeah, that's what it'll for me. And then I think a part of that is form and how we can undo form um, as a writer and as, as playwrights, um, thinking about how we can find our own structures that like we, we've known for a long time that, um, yeah, that have been silenced and, and erased from us and a lot of the colonial histories. Something that feels freeing to me is um, the border between art forms kind of going away. 
Um, I to tag on to the last questions, like some a way that I found a lot of self care is like by investing in other Black artists, Michaela Cole and Issa Rae, and like all of the people who are where I want to be. Um, and something I really appreciate about them is that the policing that other people do um, or try to place upon them. Um, has not stopped them from moving in the world. And that's something that um, I get policed a lot. So I'm very, so freedom for me looks like I can't stop the policing from happening, but I can at least stop myself from being affected by it. Um, and just being able to like, not just be an actor, but to also be able to write, to direct, to produce, and to find like a home in all of those mediums fluidly. Y'all are so poetic because like as soon as I heard the question, I was like, oh, McDonald's and Bugs Life. That's what freedom looks like to me. Like I specifically on a serious note, I think freedom really just looks like being and able to do things without anyone asking you to like to explain it. Like honestly, like I get really bogged down specifically in the realms of like the pressures of institutions and white supremacy of being told over and over again, what are you doing? And I'm like, I was doing the same thing I was doing every day, but it's because it's weird. Cause uh, I think in the realm of like, yell that we all are in, they're like, oh, I came in here doing the weird quirky black girl shit that everyone said that I was supposed to be doing. And then as soon as I get here, everyone's asked me like, well, why are you doing that weird black girl thing? Well, y'all told me to do the thing that y'all told me to do at the school. So I guess like the freedom that I look like is being able to do whatever I want to do without anyone asking me to do. I mean, like, God bless his soul, kind of like a Kanye situation where, like, I get to do whatever I want <laughs> in the realms of, like, specifically not being asked and to do, uh, or being asked consistently of, like, what this is. It's like, you can Google it. Everyone has, like, the same amount of information. But I feel like, as well, still being, you know, like, the McDonald's and Bugs Life situation, just being able to do whatever I want without anyone asking me how to do it or why I'm doing it. I think that freedom uh, for me as a director is theaters really moving towards wanting to uplift the stories of Black voices without posturing and uh, being more concerned with the monetization of Black stories and seeing how valuable that is in their season. And I think that that starts with, you know, if these theaters want to accept us and invite us in, and then, you know, you sit in these meetings, they're like, I don't understand what's going on. Of course you don't understand what's going on and not having to go through that barrier of having to explain well, um, in Black culture, this means this, and the Black people in the audience are going to understand this. I think that by having to educate and prove, um, in a way, having to prove and justify Blackness to white people is, like, extremely violent. Um, and I think that that happens very often. And I think that if, if these institutions aren't going to give the latitude for Black people to use their voices as vocally as they can. And the only way that Black people can give their voices as vocally as they can is if it's as far away from its proximity to whiteness as possible. So of course, you know, there are gonna be things that white people don't understand that are going on in these Black plays. I think institutions, I know institutions have to let go of that. And that's when the real beginnings of things are going to start to happen. But that is still policing. Coming in and making, having to, ex to explain to someone, having to explain to a white person why this moment matters or what this means because that institution is who is employing you, that is policing. And if you are really about your EDI, if you're really about the work that you're doing, if you're really about uplifting these stories, then, then, then go out of the room and let it happen because it's not gonna happen. Your presence is not gonna contribute in a, in, a, in a wholly global way to the uplifting of black voices in the way that I think that um, a lot of institutions assume based off of pedagogy that it will. Wow, thanks y'all, I'm blown away, I moved to tears. And um, you're right, I love tater tots, you know, it's just something about them. So there's freedom in that, but I don't think my nutritionist would approve of me just eating tater tots. Uh, such a complicated life we have in present day. Um, thank you all so much for your time. Um, I invite the audience to please type your questions um, on the Q&A function. We have one already, so I'm gonna start it off with that. Um, from Nicole Nelson. Thank you for your question. Um, but in the meantime, feel free to just use the Q&A function to type your question and then um, 
we'll answer it. So Nicole Nelson asked, um, this is for AK Payne's play, Where Pathways Meet. Did you create this play as a way for the promises of the civil rights movement to intersect with the space race between the US and the Soviet Union so that your African-American characters could benefit from both events as acts of black liberation. Whoa, Nicole, I love this closer read. Thank you. Um, so yeah, one of the big things I love about playwriting is that there's like so many different things that are added onto it, like when you're creating. So like, yeah, I, I didn't think of this when I was writing this. And I think that like, it's really exciting that that's a take that you have for it. And I think that that's relevant to the sort of storytelling that I, that I was interested in of just like how we imagine freedom for ourselves um, and how we how we have been a part of these histories. Um, yeah, so thank you for that question. And I think that there's a lot of different, I think that Where Pathways Meet is a piece that I'm actively asking questions about all the time because I think there's so many different metaphors and it traffics so much in metaphor. So uh, there's a lot of things that I think can exist within it and exist, yeah, in tandem with it. So thank you. Okay, so we have a question from Joni Banks Hunt. Um, thank you for this question, Joni. Um, and they would like to know, how does it feel to be free to express who you are as a vibrant, vibrant picture of Black love for our culture? And maybe a, a, an additional question to tack on to that is, do you feel free? Um, and if you do, how does that feel? And if you don't, how does that feel? Um, I mean, when I do these works, I feel free. <laughs> I, I know that like, a big thing for 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 me this uh, summer was to like really be able to immerse myself in black work and just just live in it. There there's sometimes we would finish rehearsal and there's this when you shut your computer and you no longer have the people around you, that lingering feeling that you have out after a rehearsal where things have set and marinated and you are in this soup of stuff together. It's just like you're in it by yourself. And it has, it like you, sometimes I have to take some time to just, I don't know, like take a walk or uh, listen to some um, Sade or something so that I could just, you know, because it, 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 it it becomes part of you. A part of me is Minnie. A part of me is Rosina, right? There's a, there's a part of me that is all these characters and um, uh, you, they can't leave you in a way, but, but if you want to like really immerse yourself in the work, if you really want to soak in it, you know, um, you take the time that you have to just, I am with I am with the playwright's words, and I am the actor trying to just marinate in this like life that I'm living in. Um, even if I have to like close the the computer afterwards and like be by myself, it hurts, but it also is like fulfilling in a way. If that answered the question. We're going to move on just because y'all are coming with beautiful questions. So thank you. Catherine Chihi, love you so much, Catherine Chihi. Catherine Chihi asks, um, 
Could the two playwrights on the call, AK and Angie, mention a few of the writers who have inspired their plays? Do you two identify yourselves um, in these works? Do they identify themselves in these works as part of a tradition of Black writers whom they admire? And uh, Gloria Majule, who wrote Blessings, is not on the call, unfortunately, but she's here with us in spirit. Um, but our two lovely queries who are here, if you wouldn't mind answering. So basically, um, do you identify and do you see yourself a part of a tradition of Black writers? Um, yeah, so definitely. Um, I think for this particular piece, uh, I really look to like, so Amna B.C. Phillip, she's a poet who I love. Um, and so Christina Sharp as well, uh, Robin B.G. Kelly. I have a list at the beginning of the play that I'm reading right now. Um, and um, also some musicians, so like Sun Ra, Nina Simone, and Prince, and Minnie Evans, who is a visual artist. Um, I think that I really try to locate my work and my storytelling in like the Black radical tradition because um, I feel like that there's a lot of, of potential in there to imagine new worlds and new land for ourselves and yeah, but thank you for that question. Uh, a question from Madame, we love that. Um, I definitely do think I am um, in, in the tradition of uh, the black arts movement that was started in the 70s. A lot of my um, family members are like black intellectuals and artists. So they were basically like transplants of that movement. So growing up, I've definitely heard a lot of like the conversations of what it was like to be in that movement in terms of black liberation, but also in terms of like freedom of expression and humor and comedy, not necessarily in terms of like the pathos of what it is to be a part of black life, but what is it to be happy? And so I think the the writings that I actually look to a lot for, at least for Daughters of the Confederacy, wasn't really a lot for playwrights. It was actually from a lot of like 1970s, 80s, 90s, like black comedy comedians. Like I was listening to a lot of uh, uh, Richard Pryor, a lot of listening to a lot of like um, older Dave Chappelle and Chris Rock. And I think a lot of the times we don't really consider stand up comedians as writers because we don't really see them in the writing process. We're usually watching them in like the stamina of what it is to put on performance but I think for me listening and then also just hearing the the words of what these artists were saying was actually very important of like a lot of the text that was actually being spoken to of like the delivery the rhythm and the timing and also just like what are they saying in terms of the pathos I think one part in the rehearsal process we had like I just sent them uh everyone like a list of like things that like I loved in terms of black comedy like I showed them like Leslie Jones and like uh uh, like more like Richard Pryor and I said, uh, and I think we were having that conversation of what it is to deal with trauma and how to, how do we laugh at it? And I was like, oh, we just have to listen to like Richard Pryor's a bit about how he lit himself on fire, free, free, uh, free basing on cocaine. Like the, I heard that in high school and I was like, this is the funniest thing I've ever heard in my life. But it was also very, very tragic at like the very minimal part of like his whole life. So I guess like a lot of like the things that I'm very invested in have always been in the realms of comedy. Like I've definitely was influenced by George C. Wolfe, uh, the Colored Museum. Um, a lot of like uh, black writers who may if not like be known in terms of like the, the white consciousness, if you will. But I definitely do think that those and also listening to like family members and listening to like so many intricate parts of like black life has definitely influenced like uh, daughters in, in retrospect and also growing up in the South. That's fun. <laughs> Um, I love both of these an answers and Angie specifically, I think that the conversation about comedy and blackness really needs to be at the forefront of like people's consciousness because I think there's something really <laughs> Greek about the extremes of comedy and tragedy that just coalesce to form a lot of what black life is in America. Um, and shout out to AK's <laughs> reading list because I'm working through it right now. Um, and it is changing a lot of um, my thought processes. Um, so we have a question from anonymous attendee and uh, they would like to hear from the playwrights again. Sorry, y'all. Um, and they're asking, um, after seeing your work performed in this way via Zoom, are there any aspects of your work that stood out or rang differently than you had originally expected? I can go. Uh, 
It's funny because like earlier this morning today, I was watching like these Zoom like uh, table reads of like TV shows. Like they'll just all come together and they do like table reads of like old episodes. So I was watching one for Community. And it was so funny because like the, the episode that they were doing was like an episode I've seen before. But I think it was so hilarious because I was still dying in my like kitchen listening to it because I was just literally hearing like the writing and the joke writing and like the delivery and the timing of the actors. And even without like the visual element of like seeing them doing it in the episode still made it for me. And I think that's actually something that I witness a lot within the rehearsal space with daughters was like, I like hearing like the thing out loud, even if it was over Zoom and letting the actors go and letting like Christopher uh, take over the reins of what that was, I think was like a very enjoyable experience for me. Um, I don't particularly like enjoy listening to my words. Sorry. I don't like listening to my words out loud specifically when it's being read for the first time because it's always that journey of like, okay, like we're going to figure out like what world <laughs> that we're in. But I feel like immediately like when we started, it was like the same kind of like intensity. I like just listening to like this old community episode like I heard when I was in high school to like now I'm like, oh, this is still like funny. And I'm like, I hate li listening to like things I write like, oh, that's a joke. Da, da, da. I was like, oh, but this is great because seeing them go even on a, uh, on Zoom was still it's exciting for me, honestly. And I think that's just kind of like the thing of, you know, we're alone in our houses majority of the time, or at least like for me, like I'm living by myself. So like, like hearing people like out loud, like in, in the space that is in mind feels more intimate. And it feels like more uh, like, oh, like, it's kind of like still the same aspect of not trying to uh, put the two mediums together of like TV and like theater, but it's like, oh, you're in my living room. And I feel kind of like invited to like feeling that I'm there. And with that, it makes it even more, you know, intimate in the same way that I would be in theater where I'm like, y'all are like really like this in front of me. And then y'all, I can literally see the spit that y'all having all the way through. Like, so there's a different levels of intimacy that I definitely noticed within this process that I thought was actually really exciting to see pandemic and all. <laughs> Yeah, and I'll echo, I think the intimacy thing was a huge part for me, because I think there are a lot of really quiet scenes, especially between Minnie and Dwight in, in this particular play, where it, like, they're, they're opened up something for me and seeing it, seeing it on Zoom because of the sort of closeness uh, that we were able to employ in that, um, in that, in that um, Abigail and Shayun were able to embody. Um, and I think that in that, too, like, I think that the core of theater is imagining what what isn't there, of course, and like imagine like imagining beyond. And so, in this particular uh, Zoom performance, because we didn't have like we everything is imagined because we're just like looking at each other. Um, I think that there was even more room for the imagination in that, um, which I think was really freeing uh, in terms of like just being able to 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 just leave everything open. Like, what does freedom mean to you? Uh, and that that being able to change according to who's watching it and bearing witness in a new way. Thank you. Um, we have comments left and we're going to read them aloud because um, we love affirmation. <laughs> um, so we have a comment from Dr. James Perlato, who's a Yale Summer Cabaret board member. So thank you so much for your support. Um, James said, uh, Zoom productions definitely feel like theater, not film. Yet the focus on such close up visions of the performers gives even more than a front row seat to subtle expressions and nuances of acting. It is an interesting hybrid of stage and video. Thanks for the great performances to each of you, Dr. Jim Perlato. Thank you so much for that comment. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a weird liminal space to be in, you know, but we're doing the best we can. We're making it work. Um, so this next comment uh, made me laugh, uh, <laughs> and I see, I see perhaps anonymous because these are my exact thoughts. Um, but this person said, "I'm so very proud of all of you, detective, playwright. Did you know that the officer was guilty? Mama, thank you for getting justice. Next time, pay someone else to do it. Advice to take to the bank." <laughs> Um, amazing. Um, thank you all so much. I guess I have one question for Liam and Edmund. 
Um, thank you so much for rocking with us on this call. Um, and thank you. I guess, what was it like for you making those technical decisions? Where were those design decisions or, you know, stage management decisions to have them enter a certain way or in a certain time or come in on a certain kind of music? We always love hearing um, what it's like to cook up on the back end. Liam, I'll let you take this and then I'll answer. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, it's it's a really interesting, um, designing sound for Zoom is, sorry, I'm just gonna take one of my headphones off because otherwise I sound weird in my head. Um, it's really interesting designing for Zoom. Um, all the kind of, so many of the tricks you get used to in um, live theater, like, you know, sounds coming from different spaces, sounds kind of coming in under like a speech and supporting an actor's voice. All of those things are like totally thwarted by Zoom. Um, you know, you can't have multiple sounds playing at the same time. You can't have sound come from different directions. So you really have to be very, very specific um, and very kind of like essential in the choices you make, um, which I think leads to a really, uh, I don't know, can, can, can lead to some really interesting, you know, ways of sonic storytelling. Um, so, so in terms of process, um, basically, I had conversations with, with Christopher and with Alex, and we would talk about the kind of sound needs for the show. And yeah, just the way to, to kind of support that in, and, and to kind of like execute those decisions and, and tell the story in usually like the simplest uh, and most concise and often quickest way that we could um, sonically to just try and like, you know, to, to tell the story and to, and to like aid in the telling of the story. But like as has been alluded to before, like the text is really the carrier um, of the piece in, the, in this format, and so to really not interfere with the text, um, or to you know to interfere as little as possible. Uh, and I think uh, on my end, it was definitely different. This is definitely a different experience. Uh, about a solid eighty-five to ninety percent of the things that I would normally do doesn't exist in the realm of in Zoom theater. So it was a lot of also reinterrogating and reexamining who I am in these processes and in the space when uh, working with individuals, which was really nice is almost everyone um, that worked on these shows this summer were someone that I had already worked with. Um, so for me, it was more of just continuing that connection with people that I have already worked with and engaged with um, and definitely filled a sense of community and those things that we've been missing since uh, COVID started and all of the craziness. But it's uh, definitely been nice to be able to just be a part of sitting back and listening and watching and kind of engaging in the text like everyone has been saying, because um, I'm not spending all this time figuring out um, when these light cues are gonna happen or when sound is gonna happen or how entrances and exits or costume changes are gonna happen. Um, and I definitely feel like over these last three weeks, I've been so much more connected and engaged with the conversations that are happening in the room and in the space and what the text is actually saying, um, instead of having to kind of be split focused on, yes, I'm hearing this point because this is really like great and creative, but also how do I make sure that this vision of the scene comes together logistically or have we asked these questions of these different departments or am I taking notes about these things and I was really able to sit back and let um, let the artists work and then also just sit back and enjoy watching the artists work in, in ways that I don't normally get to do when I'm sitting um, behind a table in the rehearsal room. So that part was fun. Definitely was hard not having personal connection time. Uh, it's weird when we go on a break and normally I would walk around and check in with people on breaks and see how things are going and uh, talk about daily life and stuff like that and instead on Zoom uh, break means everyone turns their cameras off, meets their mics and walks away for 10 to 15 minutes and it's um, a much more disconnecting than we're used to in the actual rehearsal rooms. Uh, but eventually I think we'll figure out ways to make sure that that community aspect of it still stays. Um, so one of the recent comments that we got is actually for you, Liam, um, and it says that the church organ music was powerful and eerie. Um, and I just want to just give you a special shout out for all of your work that you did, especially when you were moving. 
um, and say how grateful we are for you and your arsenal of fire sounds. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, Lots of fire this season. Yeah. Yeah. What can we say? We're trying to burn everything to the ground. Um, <laughs> and Edmund, I also wanted to say thank you to you for your sense of humor um, and for your continuous, wonderful emails that tell us everything we need to know the night before. Um, so if there are, since there are no other questions, I want to take this opportunity to thank um, the MESA sponsors um, and the leadership team uh, for putting together such an interesting and necessary season. Um, we love you and we're grateful for all of your work. Um, and we also, of course, want to thank our audience because without you, there would be nothing. You would just be in the abyss, which we kind of already are. Um, so <laughs> thank you everyone for coming um, and we hope that you have a good night.